Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV. My name is Ian McNay and today we have a guest in the studio, Morgan Fisher. Hello Morgan. Hello Ian. And Morgan and I go back a long time. He was one of the first artists to be involved with Cherry Red when we started in 1978. And his career, of course, goes back far earlier than that. He was, in, he was originally in Love Affair and then he was, got involved with Mott the Hoople and Mott and British Lions and many other adventures. And we're going to today look at, ha have an overview of Morgan's life and his musical side and a little bit personally as well and just see where the story takes us. So, I guess, Morgan, we start with Love Affair. You were sure. 16 years old, you were at school doing yeah. your exams. Um, how did the band come about? Well, there, there was a young lad called Maurice Bacon who was a drummer and he came from a drumming family. His uncle, Max Bacon, was one of the well-known drummers in the English big bands, in the, even before the war, I think. So it was in his blood, and he, he really wanted to be a, a drummer. And his father was also a part-time drummer, Sid Bacon, and also a handbag manufacturer. That's how <laughs> Sid made his business. And we'll get back to that later. You'll see why I bring that up. And Sid, being a generous father, said, well, I'll make a band for you. So basically... I can't quite remember how we found each other, but he put adverts somewhere, I think. Probably Melody Maker, something like that, saying, you know, um, forming a soul band, because Maurice Bacon liked soul music, as many of us did then, because we were all young mods, and we were into Stax and Motown and all that stuff. So the band was originally called The Soul Survivors, and we just got together like that, I think, but none of us knew each other. Except that Steve Ellis, the singer who we found, actually lived two roads from me in Finchley, but we didn't know each other until we joined Love Affair or Soul Survivors. And we just started rehearsing all the soul numbers that we loved. And that's, that's, that's really how we got going. And we played our first gig in a youth club called The Spec, somewhere in Edgware, I think. It's funny how I remember that. And um, Sid Bacon put a load of money into the band. He bought all the equipment drums, guitars, organ. He bought me the same organ as the animals used to use. It was a very cool red, black and white organ. Same colour scheme as today. Always cool. And uh, I was very happy to get my hands on this organ, you know. And I'd never played, actually, an organ in my life until I joined the band. Is that right? So you actually learned as you went along? Yeah, I, used to, I did used to go down the centre of London and go to the organ shops. And try organs and out. Practice in the organs. Yeah, they, they didn't seem to mind. I'd yeah. sit there for half an hour playing a Hammond. So that was my only experience playing yeah. organs in those days. But I had a piano at home, a okay. family piano. This yeah. is what I learnt on. Yeah, yeah. And then you had a number one single. Um, well, yeah. The lasting love. They did. They did because I wasn't actually in the band at that point. As you say, okay. I was doing exams, and my A levels were coming up. By which time we'd, we'd got into fairly regular gigging, not just in London, but in nearby towns. And uh, eventually both my teachers and my mother, who was a school teacher herself, said, you need to make your mind up. Do you want to do music or do you want to study? Of course, I actually knew which one I wanted to do, but they preferred that I studied and did my A-levels. So I've got something under my belt I can always fall back on. Right. I've never fallen back on them, but never mind. And, um, so you left the band? So I left the band okay. just to finish my A-levels. Okay. So it was last nine months of my school career, I think, I wasn't playing. And during those nine months, they had a number one hit, Everlasting Love. And they were on top of the pops every week. And, and there's me studying. You must have felt terrible. I did. So I just thought, well, never mind. Um, I, bet, I bet you felt more you know, than, <laughs> than never mind. <laughs> Yeah, I just, but I, I carried on studying reluctantly and without making any effort, I passed all my four A-levels, what a clever lad. And then after that, I got accepted to three universities. But just, I, I was too shy to say it myself, I actually got a friend to write a letter to Love Affair, probably to Maurice Bacon, saying, I don't know if you know, but Morgan's um, just left school and he's sort of available. Right. I just thought I'd give it a whirl. Right. You never know. And they answered. And they said, well, actually, 
we don't really get on very well with the keyboard player we got in. So yeah, come back. So like, talk about a stroke of luck. I mean, they'd already had a number one. They were all famous, including the new keyboard player. Right. But they wanted to get him out and get me back in. So uh, I was in. So you were suddenly a pop star. Yeah, from, from uh, A-levels to top yeah. of the pops. Yeah. Instantly, and then there I was. Oh, fantastic. So what luck. And then you did it, you did what, three or four more singles? We did, yeah. The, um, we had three or four more top ten hits. Rainbow Valley, A Day Without Love. Those were the two big follow-ups. And you played on all those, obviously. No, that was the other problem. OK, we tell We didn't us about play it. on them. <laughs> what happened then? Well, in those days, it was very common for very young bands like us to... They didn't play on the record, they used session men. And... Um, that's what we did. And it seemed to be perfectly acceptable. The band didn't mind. Uh, the record company were quite pleased because they knew it would be really good quality. Yeah. So they got in all these great session men like Herbie Flowers on bass and Clem Cattini on drums and, I don't know, what's his name, Chris Bedding on guitar. People like that, really hot session yeah, men. Sure. Maybe even Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones. They were doing all that kind of That's work right. a yeah. lot in those yeah. days. People like Herman's Hermits did it. Lots of bands did it. And it was accepted. No one really talked about it. And the band obviously had to be good enough to play the songs live, which we were. But the band actually admitted it on TV one day, that they hadn't played on the record. And this was a huge controversy. It, it, it was headlines, not only in music papers, but in national papers. So the love affair, don't play on the record. Except for the singer, obviously, yes. was on there. But we carried on for two or three more singles, just doing it the same way. But I think that basically... It was a kiss of death for the band. And uh, it, it, we gradually went down and down and down in popularity. Well, people buy the records because they think you're on the records. Well, that's a huge enough. blow if you're a teenage girl and you're, buy, you're buying the records to, to hear your idols play and they're not on the records. Well, obviously the singer is the main attraction. and yeah. You know, it wasn't instant death for the band. I mean, we still had some more top ten hits. But, yeah, we shouldn't have said that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And we ended up playing cabaret and, and working men's clubs, which was like the worst thing you can do, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's just depressing. I mean, we played clubs where, you know, north of England, where there were signs in the dressing room saying, any artiste mentioning football on stage will be paid off by the management. Because <laughs> if you mention a team on stage, you oh, could cause a riot. That's right, of course. <laughs> so they had signs yeah. like that, and then we yeah. thought, this is not for us, is it? So we just gave up in the end. And you changed um, the name to L.A. at one point? We did do that. We tried to, as the phrase went in those days, we tried to go heavy. Because we were actually all into, you know, all the other current really good bands like Spooky Tooth and Pink Floyd and blah, 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 and Jimi Hendrix. We were into all that music as well as soul music. But we'd had this pop image because of our hits. And so, you know, partly we didn't really enjoy the pop image because we... We still get ripped apart by fans when we came out of gigs. It was still like Beatlemania in those days. Yes. And um, the music, you know, we were limited musically. So for the second album, we decided to, as they say, go heavy and, and start doing stuff more like the stuff we were listening to, a bit more progressive. And thought, so we thought it'd be good to change the name. So we just used the initials LA, which sounded really cool. Yeah. And uh, that wiped the band out, basically, because <laughs> the new fans... I mean, we couldn't get any new fans, because most people thought we are just a pop band. So all the people into heavy music didn't care about Love Affair whatsoever. Yeah. And the existing Love Affair fans couldn't understand our new music, so we lost them as well. So yeah. basically, we went down, and that was it. And then you recorded a solo album. You formed your own band with the name Morgan. Is yeah. that right? Is that sequentially correct? That's right. Me and the drummer, Morris, carried on. And I started writing very complicated progressive rock music and really enjoying it. And so we got in a bass player called Bob Sapsid and a singer called Tim Staffel, who was a singer and a guitarist and a good songwriter as well. And we, we've, I couldn't think of any other name, so I just thought, well, let's call it Morgan. And, uh, That's a good name. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. And uh, the, this is where the handbag connection comes in. Okay. <laughs> so we made some demos and uh, didn't get a good enough reaction in England. Not, we didn't get a record deal in England, so we were wondering what to do. And our manager, through his handbag connection, 
got us a deal with RCA in Italy, because Italy is where most handbags are made, because of the quality of the leather. So we ended up signing to RCA Italy and going to Rome to make records, which is great, because Rome had the best studio in the world at that right. time. It was yeah. 16 track. Huge studio with four different studios, two for bands, one for an orchestra and a massive one for opera and things like Fellini's film scores. So it was a really cool studio yeah. to be in. And we made, the band made two albums and I made a solo album over a period of about a year. And the first album came out on RCA Italy and RCA worldwide I think as well. Well certainly in England. And that was called Nova Solis. Very spacey sound. It was like a space opera in a way. A bit of a concept album. Right, quite a difference know. from Love Affair. In this Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bringing out the different sides of you. Oh, yeah. And then you joined Brief the Third Year Band, a little progressive band. But let me just say one more thing about the Morgan Band. And the singer we got in was actually from a band called Smile. Oh, they became Queen, didn't they? They became Queen. That's right. Yeah. And so... <coughs> I don't quite know why he left Smile, I'm not sure, but um, Smile consisted of him and Brian May and Roger Taylor. Right. And maybe one other bass player, I'm not sure who that was, it wasn't, it wasn't a Queen's bass player. Anyway, Tim left Smile to join Morgan and uh, the other guys from Smile, especially Brian May, used to come and see Morgan play regularly. So we did a residency at the Marquee Club and Brian May was there every time, so we got to know him. And then I remember Tim taking me back to his house one, one day and, and introduced me to some guy and he said, oh, this is a new singer in Smile, I just joined. And uh, there was this really shy, kind of dark-skinned guy dressed in velvet and, and that was Freddie Mercury. Huh. He was really shy, <laughs> can yeah. you imagine that? Yeah. So Freddie joined Smile and of course everyone knows what happened then. Yeah. So, that was an interesting connection, which also, we'll see, comes, the circle closes again a few years later. So, anyway, <laughs> that was dramatic, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 30 Well, the Morgan band, yeah. band um, you know, we put out one album, it was okay, yeah. but it didn't sell enough, so, sadly, the record company decided not to release the second Morgan album, which is called The Sleeper Wakes, or my own album, my own solo album, so we were a bit disappointed by that, and... Once again, the band folded. And at that point, I was at the ripe old age of, what, 23? I was thinking of quitting the music business. You know, I thought, well, I've tried it with pop, I've tried it with progressive rock. We, we had some success, but we failed, basically. So I just got a job driving a van for an off-license in Finchley, where I lived, and kept my eye on the back of Melody Maker, which is where all the bands advertised for new members. And I think it was through that that I joined the Third Year Band, which I'd been very interested in. They're a pretty cool band. They'd done that film score for Polanski's Macbeth. So a pretty hip band, and uh, they just wanted a new synthesizer player. So I ended up doing, I think, two radio shows and one gig with them. And then I noticed another ad in the back of Melody Maker where it said, name rock band with imminent US tour seeks keyboard player. It sounded quite appealing, didn't it? Well, the imminent yeah. US tour was very attractive because yeah. I'd never been there. And I yeah. thought, well, this sounds good. Because, you know, the, the bands never put their name because otherwise yes. they get hundreds of hangers on calling them up, you know. Yeah. So I didn't know who it was. So I called them up and they, they still didn't tell me who it was. They just said, come down to Chelsea for an audition. So I went down there. And um, I'm very relaxed at auditions, actually. I was so relaxed. I got there early and there was an off-license next to the studio and I... Fancied a drink before the audition because I had about half an hour to kill. And uh, they, had this, they were selling these little one glass sized sachets of wine, so I bought one. I said, Can I borrow a glass? And the guy in the off license said, Sure, and I'll just stand here and drink it. So I was standing in the off license <laughs> with a glass of wine. And then um, over in Watts, the bass player from Mot the Hoople came in and said, Oh, can you come down now and play with us? And I thought, Well, I'll just keep the wine. and walk into the studio, very nonchalant. Cheers, lads. And they play two songs and I play two songs. I mean, they played two songs and then I played the same songs. So was, was it a shock when you realised which band it was? 
No, because no. not really. I mean, I knew it would be a band of yeah. certain stature. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I actually wasn't a the Hoople fan at that point. I'd seen them play a couple of times, and I thought, that's nah, quite good rock, you know, basic. Because I was really into progressive rock at that time. Still, but you were going to an audition and having to play and not knowing what you had to play, presumably. That's right. You had to pick it up as you got there. Oh yeah, they didn't have scores or anything. Yeah. They just played two songs and said, right now you play. And I could, my ear was good enough yeah, that I can pick yeah. things up instantly. And they're not difficult songs, not compared to the complex progressive rock I've been doing, you know. So I was completely relaxed about the whole thing, and they said, well, thanks a lot, we'll let you know. And I got home. A couple hours later, they called me up and said, OK, you've got the job if you want it. And I thought, well, great. And uh, they seemed like a really nice bunch of lads. So I was very happy about that. And at what point in, that, in their career was that? A very good point, because they'd... They'd had the big hit, They'd all the had the dudes. biggest hit, all the young dudes, yeah. about, I don't know, six months before. So they were riding high. American tour was looking very good, good-sized venues. And um, the first thing I did with them was to go in the studio to finish off Roll, Roll Away the Stone, which was their follow-up single to All the Young Dudes. And they just were doing some overdubs, and they said, we need a bit of synth on it or something. So I just added a bit of synth, and that was the first thing I did with them. And uh, it was an air studio, so it was like nice to be in a really good studio, with good engineer, and, you know, I thought, right, here we go again. And uh, within weeks, I think, I was in the States, which was uh, a wonderland for me. To go to America in 73, with a successful band playing, you know, like between three to 10,000 seaters every night. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I, I wasn't really into American music that much until then, apart from blues and jazz, which I've been into since I was very young. But, I mean, American rock didn't interest me so much. It seemed a bit of a caricature, like Elvis and Little Richard. They seemed more like Hollywood figures than the real rockers like, you know, Hendrix, Cream, blah, blah, blah. When I got there, I, I immediately and totally understood why American rock is like it is, because it is a totally different culture to Europe. It's a totally new, young culture. And that was thrilling. I mean, just going to diners. There were real diners. There were real Cadillacs around. And it wasn't a dream. It wasn't just a movie. That's what life's you like in there. America. Yeah. And yeah. It, I thought, wow, this is really cool. And, I, I, and then I started to enjoy American music, like rock and roll. Plus, we had incredible bands opening for us because we had... The uh, first gig I did with Mott was in Chicago. Opening band was Joe Walsh and Barnstorm. I don't remember Joe Walsh. He's, he's course, with the Eagles yeah, yeah, now. That's right, yeah. Who was at the peak of his career musically, and they were incredible. Yeah. Soon after that, I think it was the second tour, we had the New York Dolls opening for us for a couple of weeks, which was like punk before punk. That's right. They were yeah, amazing. Yeah, so I watched yeah. them every night yeah, from yeah. the wings. Yeah. And we had a, a, a young band with a rather extrovert singer who looked a bit like Mick Jagger, a band called Aerosmith, who opened for us for a yeah. couple of weeks. So a pretty interesting uh, introduction to American music. And was, was that the tour when Ian Hunter wrote his book, Is It Die a Rock and Roll Star? That was the tour before right, I joined, just okay. before. Yeah. Very good book, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Great yeah. stories, yeah. Yeah. So, and then you played on, was it two albums with Mott? Yeah. Uh, well, yes. There was another single, Honolulu Boogie, and then we did an, an album called The Hoople. Right. And then we did a live album, which right. was half American, half English gigs. And the American one was our, from our week on Broadway. So we were the first band to play in a Broadway theatre. And they recorded that. It's a damn shame they didn't film it as well. What a pity. It but wasn't they, so common in those days, was it? To, uh, no, to film well, like I mean, that. video's so easy and cheap to do yeah, now, but I film think, yeah. needs a bigger yeah. budget. So pity about that. And then... Ian Hunter left. That was a shame. Yeah. Um, How did you feel then? That was kind of, there you were in an amazing situation playing the big band. And about to become even more amazing because we just, uh, Mick Ronson had just joined us as a guitarist. Yeah. Who'd been working with Bowie for That's years. Right. So it yeah. was like, that was like Ian Hunter's dream come true. Yeah. And for all of us too. And we started doing a, a European tour and did about 10 gigs with Mick. 
and we're planning to do a long English tour and we suddenly got the news that Ian had had some kind of breakdown and was in hospital and wouldn't be able to finish the tour. Yeah. And I still don't really know why or how it happened to him. Was there any signs that he was having a difficult time personally? I don't think so. No. There were signs of a split in the band, which I could sort of watch. As, as still a fairly new member, I could watch it like... Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson were like this, you know. Yes. And um, Pete Watson and Buffin, Dale Griffin, the drummer, were sort of the other side. And I could see a split coming. And they weren't communicating very well. And uh, I was in the middle. I was sort of easygoing about everything. Yeah. But then when suddenly when Ian and Mick went off to America, it wasn't a big surprise to me. It was a big disappointment, because the band looked like we were really going to get big now. You know. It's so often the case, isn't it? Something's on the brink of really happening, and then mm. all falls apart for some reason. Yeah, and I'm not knocking Ian for doing it, but it can often happen that a singer feels that he doesn't need the band anymore, whereas it was actually that combination that made the band what it was. Even though most of the songs were written by Ian, the band was a great unit. I mean, yeah. uh, the rhythm section were still, to me, one of the best and most interesting rhythm sections I've ever worked with. The bass player and the drummer were, were brilliant, I thought. But there you go. But one door closes, another one opens, you know. That's life. And so you kept going the rest of the band as Mott? Yeah, we got another singer in called Nigel Benjamin. Yeah. Did two albums as Mott. Um, once again, I came up against a record company not wanting to release an album. So they, I think it was Columbia in those days, released the first album called Drive On by Mott. Sorted out a tour for us, which was okay um, in America as well. Um, and then very quickly had us make a second album right after the tour with hardly any time to write new songs. And we were complaining, saying we need more time, we need more time. And yeah. They said, no, we need a new album. So we made a new album in a tremendous rush. And, and it did come out. It's called Shouting and Pointing. But then it didn't sell enough, so that was the end of that. And they said, well, if we don't want any more albums, bye. So, and actually, we'd not felt really comfortable with the singer we got in. So, we were wondering what to do. We've got no record contract now, no gigs to do. And um, we had some free time. So I was asked to play with a friend's band called Medicine Head, who I'd known for quite a long yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And actually, they were going through a split up of an end of a band. So it was actually their last tour. They knew it was their last tour, but they needed a keyboard player. And I thought, well, this would be nice to do because things hadn't been very happy in our camp. So I thought, well, I really like Medicine Head. So I yeah. thought, this would be fun. Just about a two or three week tour of England. And I really enjoyed it. And I, I thought, because I'd known John Fiddler, the, the singer and the main songwriter, for some years. And he's a really nice guy. He's a really close friend. So that was really fun. And then I finished that tour and Medicine had basically folded at that point. I think they'd also had record company problems and were now without a deal. And then I went back to see Martin and said, what should we do, what should we do? And I just thought, well, wait a minute. Here's Mott, who's a, who don't want their singer anymore. And here's a fantastic singer, John Fiddler, who doesn't have a band anymore. Put them together. So I spoke to Mott and I spoke to John and they were both like, oh, interesting. Because all the guys in Mott respected John Fiddler. And John Fiddler just said, I'll do it if you change the name, as long as it's not still Mott. Which is fair enough, because Mott were basically Ian Hunter's songs and Ian Hunter's image yeah, and so on. Yeah, an association quite strong. With yeah, them, and yeah. obviously we would play the old hits and so on. Yeah. So he said, I'll do it as long as we can have a new identity. And I thought it was a good idea. The rest of the band thought, oh dear, we're going to lose even what reputation we've still got. But yeah. in the end, we thought, yeah, it's a good idea to start fresh. So we went through the usual painful process of looking for a new band name. And uh, we settled on British Lions as a way to, I think, express our Englishness. Because we were looking towards America as the bigger market to succeed in. So we thought British Lions sounds cool. So John Fiddler didn't like it much, but <laughs> that's what we decided. Um, and we started... 
writing songs with John. Well, John already had some really good songs. So it was quite easy making the first British Lions album. And you got a record deal with, with who for that? It was with um, it was RCO in the States, and here is Poly, Polygram. Polygram, yeah. Okay. I think. Yeah, and we got a new manager, which is Colin Johnson, who was Status Quo's manager. So we thought, well, he should have some, some punch, you know, he should be able to get things going for us. In theory, <laughs> so, so we did a tour supporting Status Quo. That was our first right. British tour. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, I think we went down really well. But the American side of things didn't work out very well. We did a tour in not very big places, and it wasn't promoted well. And, and for that kind of band, you, know, you needed success in, in America those days, didn't you? Really, that's where the real sales were. That and also the fact that punk was now starting up in England, yeah. so we were actually considered old farts by this time. Yeah. So England wasn't looking a good place to be musically. So we thought, well, we'll go, let's go for America. I mean, yeah. they don't expect, you know, punk had not really happened in America yet. So there wasn't this concept of people a few years older than punks being old farts because we're only five years older than, say, the Pistols, you know. So we, we really hoped to make it in America, but it just wasn't handled well. Mm. And uh, status quo actually never really made it in America, I think. So I think our manager wasn't very strong in America. So the record company refused to release the second album that we made. So that was the end of the British Lions. <laughs> I thought, here we go again. You know, what's next? And what was next? Something completely different. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely different. Because there was a punk Cherry Red Records was next. <laughs> there was a punk lurking in you somewhere, wasn't there? Kind of oh, I love the whole punk scene. Yeah. I was totally fascinated and thrilled by it. I used to go to the Roxy Club twice a week, on average, and stand there. I still had my handlebar moustache and my trilby and my <laughs> raincoat, but I'd stand there soaking it all up while there was mayhem all around me yeah. and gobbing and pogoing and yeah. all that stuff and just loving it and just the freshness of it. What was an interesting thing was also you had this black-white interface, this sort of two-tone phenomenon where the bands were all white, basically, and the DJs were all black and playing black music. Particularly the Roxy, you had Don Letts playing reggae dub, really good stuff. And that reminded me exactly ten years before, in 1966, when I was a mod, you had a similar thing, because you had the Who and the Kinks, you had these white bands, very mod, very cool. And the records we listened to in between the bands was all soul music, Stax, Motown. So that's something, I think, quite unique to London. Yes. Or England, yeah. say. And a very healthy situation, I thought. So in a way, the punk phenomenon was me sort of reliving my mod days ten years later. I was totally into it, unlike some musicians I knew. And you had this idea that was germinating in you. Well... Yeah, I mean, the punk thing was very sincere, very fresh, and very innocent, and, uh, and amateurish in a good way. And I thought, you know, I really like this. Now, what can I do that has the same kind of quality to it? Because I was basically fed up with record companies. I mean, I'd been, you know, I'd been let go by three big companies in a row, basically. I mean, Love Affair, Mott, British Lions, uh, Morgan Band, I mean. You know, we'd all basically been let go and rejected by yeah. big record companies yeah. and not supported enough. So I thought, yeah. well, I don't want to go into this again. I don't yeah. want to go that way. What can I do? And by that time, the technology was such that you could actually make records at home. I'd always had some kind of recording gear at home, and actually yeah. at that time I did have a four-track tape recorder, and I only used it for, like, sketches and ideas. But I thought, well, why can't I actually release the stuff that I'm making at home. So I uh, came up with this concept called the Hybrid Kids. Are we jumping ahead too far? No, because by that time Absolutely we'd already fine. met, but we can cover that in a minute. Yes, yeah. Because yeah. um, I'd... I was into a band called The Residents at that time who had done some really weird cover versions of things like The Beatles. They were, very, they were very kind of mystical characters in their own way, because I remember yes. once going to their studio in San Francisco, and I thought really? oh, I'd like to meet the residents, and they were in the studio, but they wouldn't come out to meet me. 
Really? It was like they wanted to keep their identity street secret. Like yeah. They had, they had this kind of real mystery around them. I know, and still do, basically. I mean, they do gigs but when they do the eyeballs, right. don't they? So That's you right. still yeah. know. I mean, yeah. somebody, was, somebody in the music business the other day was saying, I think there's only two residents, actually. In the studio, there's only two. Yeah. And they had two more when they do gigs, so I don't yeah. know. But the way they covered the Beatles songs and other songs was so fascinating. I thought, well, I wouldn't mind doing something like that. So they took well-known songs and they completely changed completely. them. Completely, yeah. yeah. They weren't the only one, wasn't it? Um, how do you say it? Ein Sturz and Neubatten. A Neubatten, yeah. Didn't they do German a Beatles band. cover? I don't know. But they, I'm they, getting they mixed up. It was, you released it, didn't you? It was, one of the, it was either that or another band from Yugoslavia or somewhere. Leibach. Well, no, Leibach, they yeah. They didn't do Beatles covers there. Anyway, let's, yeah. stick, let's stick to... Anyway, I thought, well, I'll well, try some of that. And I, I just started recording bizarre covers of songs where the, the arrangement was diametrically opposite to the original song. Yeah. So I'd... Yeah, I did one Beatles song and I did it like a sort of... Steve Reich looping thing where there's voices looping and looping and sounds like that. And I did a Sex Pistols song as if Pinky and Perky had done it. The old puppet God show. Save the Queen. Yeah. yeah. I did uh, a Scar version of MacArthur Park. And this is all done myself. I did the vocals, I played guitar, bass, keyboard. And it was done in your tiny studio flat in Notting Hill. Yeah. And in your, in your your bedsit it was kind of bedsit really, wasn't oh, it? Oh yeah, it was, it was a start of bedroom yeah. recording yeah. really, and this is yeah. 1978, right? And yeah, it's a four-track TAC tape recorder, quarter-inch tape, and sounded good to me. Yeah. And I had a very tiny mixture and a little little echo machine. Didn't have a drum machine. There weren't really any drum machines to be had much in those days. So what I did was I take loops of drums because I used to get like rough mixes and things that had parts where there was only drums on. And I take two bars of that and loop it, and that was my drumming. So it was really fun. I mean, actually cutting tape and not not yeah. using a mouse yeah. like we do now. Yeah. Just the hands on, you know. So I made that, and I remember playing it to um, one of my friends who was a punk, famous punk lady called Cherry Vanilla. Of course, who was living famous, in yeah, yeah, yeah. She was living in London yeah. at that time. Yeah. And she came over and I played it to her and she looked at me and said, you're really weird, aren't you? It's like, I thought, well, this is good. Coming from you, I'll take that as a compliment. Well, I don't feel I'm really weird. Yeah. Actually, I never have done, but there you are. And then I guess I presented it to you, didn't I? And you said, you well... To me, I loved, it. I loved the idea anyway when I first heard the initial tracks and it, mm. and it came out on Cherry Red. Yeah. As uh, we put it out originally... Um, as you, you made up band names. Well, this was your idea, actually, wasn't it? This is my idea, was it? Well, anyway, it came out as different band names. Yeah. And the, the, the story was you'd found these bands when you'd been working in America on various tours and you'd kept in contact. Yeah. And you'd got them to record these tracks, which you'd produced. Well, there was a thing going on a lot in the music press, especially NME those days, that they, wanted, they always wanted to find the future of rock. They find a man and say, this is the future of rock. Yeah. And, and often it would come from some small town in America. Cleveland was one. Akron was another, Akron, Ohio. And so these English journalists thought they were being really hip and discovering these small bands in these small towns. Right. So I thought, well, let's do something like that. Well, we, we came up with the idea together, yeah. didn't we? So I found a town which does exist called Peabody in Texas, yes. just because of the and name. most of the bands came from Peabody, didn't That's they? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And we even managed to convince Radio 1, and you did an interview with Tommy Vance, I think it was, at Radio 1. So was it? Yeah. Convincing him that these were all bands you found on the American tour. And mm. the album got, got, got well received and sold quite well. Mm. But if people that really looked at the cover, I should have brought one here, but I didn't, it does say, this is all Morgan on the cover. But you have to, you have to find that. Where is it? <laughs> Well, I, I know, I've seen it. Have you? I'll have to look at that. I mean, but, I did put my name down as producer, I think, with a photo of me. But, but uh, and then there was a follow-up, a Christmas album. Yeah, the Claws. Claws, C-L-A-W-S. Yeah. Not, not C-L-A-U-S, but it was Santa Absolutely. Claus. Yeah, um, you did a similar thing, really. It was a similar thing, and except I decided to just make it the hybrid kids because the cat was out of the bag by then. That it wasn't all Been these rumbled. bands. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I admitted it, I think. Yeah. And uh, but I went to a second album. It was, it was getting near Christmas, I think, and I thought, well, let's cover some Christmas songs. 
And actually, it wasn't so much of a parody satire thing this time. It was actually, you know, new creative versions of Christmas songs done. Like, you know, I was really into bands like um, Public Image and Wire and bands like that because it was post-punk where it started to get really interesting and more creative. And so that was my approach to that album. It's actually more of a serious approach, even as there are some humorous moments on the album. Yeah. But basically it was more... I played some really good guitar on some of that album. really enjoyed that, you know, and bass. So that was the second album, Claws. So it's, yeah, it had, you know, We Three Kings and uh, Deck the Halls with Bows of Holly yeah. and several well-known Christmas, um, Christmas carols and a song by Yoko Ono called Listen, the Snow is Falling and John Lennon's Happy Christmas, War is Over. Right. So that was quite an interesting Christmassy album. For people who wanted an alternate Christmas, you know. Absolutely. And in those days, it was, very, it was very hard to find a Christmas album that wasn't a traditional, normal Christmas album. I think it was probably the first one that was, was really different. I don't know. I guess so. And then mm. you did something else which was uh, pretty ahead of its time. As a musician, you formed your own label. But yeah, and you encouraged me. I, I, I don't know how we got to that point, but I said... I think I said I want to do some things that are even more radical than what I've just done with these two hybrid kids albums. Yeah. And you said, well, whatever you do, I'll put it out. But what about making your own label within Cherry Red? With your own identity, things? yes. So I used to smoke a pipe in those days. And uh, so I sat down, as one does when one wants to think about something. Because thinking of names for a label is like thinking of names for a band. It's, it's pure hell, basically. So I lit my pipe up. Looked at the pipe, thought, okay, pipe records. So it took about a minute, so that was decided. I thought pipe's interesting because it's sort of a musical word, like a bagpipe, you know. So I had pipe records, and then, but the big decision, the more difficult one, was what am I going to do? Because I, uh, with all this experimenting and working with new technology and making records myself and learning a hell of a lot about recording and so on, and starting to see a lot of really interesting music happening around me. I had many, many ideas, and I thought, well, you know, how many albums can I make? So I thought, well, why don't we try and get all these ideas onto one album? But I can't possibly do it all myself, because it's just too much. So why not just invite a load of people to do something, and say, give them one minute each to do whatever they want? Like the ultimate compilation album. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went through various ideas and thinking about, should there be a theme? Um... I even considered Chopin's Minute Waltz and having everyone do that, but that would have been really boring. But uh, finally, in desperation, I just thought, well, just give me a minute of whatever it is that you like to do. But I think, you know, this is probably a first, because to have a compilation album which doesn't have an overall theme musically mm. that holds it together hadn't been done before. The, the, the thing that it had in common was it was people that you like creatively or personally and both. And the tracks had to be limited to one minute each. Mm. I say limited because some were less than one minute. Mm, that's right. Yeah. So I just, I, I actually, it was ridiculous really, I put together 50 little reels with one minute of blank tape on them. As if like, well, here's your canvas, now paint right. on it. And I Absolutely. sent them out and some people wrote back and said, well, actually I haven't got a tape recorder, but thanks. <laughs> but they all found a way to do it. Yeah. And uh, actually with those that didn't have a tape recorder, for many of them, I went round with my tape recorder and recorded them at home, which included people like Quentin Crisp, Ivor Cutler, Robert Wyatt, Ralph Steadman, who did the cover. And you went down with me that day, didn't you? Yeah, it's the day when he, he broke his finger with the sash. Yes. Him, yeah. yes it's, well, that's why he subtitled his song Lament on a Broken Sash that's Chord. Because right. yeah. <laughs> he, he wanted to play guitar, I remember that. He had this song worked out on a poem of John Donne, the 16th century poet. And... Um, he sang it really well, he's got quite a nice voice actually. And then I said, um, there's a bit too much noise coming from the outside your house, so would you mind closing the window? At which point he went to the window and the, the cord broke, he slammed it on his yeah. finger, yeah. put a plaster on it and proceeded to try and play guitar. <laughs> he was really, you know, going for it and there was blood coming out of his finger all over the guitar. And we thought, this is a bit difficult, he said. I said, look, you've got this really nice organ there, harmonium, pump organ. Why don't I play the organ and you sing the song? So in the end, that's what we did. And, we, and then, 
I don't know why I closed, t- told him to close the window, because actually the only sound coming from outside was bird song, which is really nice, because he lives in the country near Maidstone. So I said, let's take the organ out in the garden and record it with the bird song. So we did that, and we had to do it quick, because then it started raining. It was just like one thing after another. But we got it in the end, and then actually before that, I'd asked him, because you know, I said to everybody on the album, I said, I haven't got any budget. I'm totally independent here. Um, actually, I did send everyone a pound cash. As just, an advance. Just, yeah. Yeah, as yeah. an advance, just to yeah. show willing. So yeah. they got a little tape, real t- minutes tape and a pound cash. Yeah. And in those days, it was um, a pound note, not a pound coin. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, only one person sent it back. Ivor Cutler said, I do not want to have the king's penny. <laughs> as if it was an insult. And then, <laughs> So I wrote back to him and said, listen, Ivor, I'm, I'm totally broke. I'm just doing my best here. He yeah. said, oh, that's all right then. So yeah. he accepted the pound. And I was a bit sneaky about it because I invited Ralph Stebman because I did know he was doing music uh, sort of as a hobby. But my plan was to ask him to do the album cover yes. and having explained to him the basis of like the one pound advance and no other recording budget I said would you be interested to do something for the cover and he said so I suppose <laughs> <laughs> you can't pay me for that either I suppose I said well no sorry and he said alright so, and he did this amazing cover did, it must have yeah. taken him ages yeah. I mean half the right half of it was an incredible collage it must have taken ages to do because yeah. he knew the concept of the album so he did this collage of thousands of different kinds of figures from all eras in music in, in human history and the other side was this huge red ear where the centre of it is this massive blot of red ink and he, apparently he laid the cam- canvas or the paper at the bottom of this long staircase, he's got this huge house, it's almost like a stately home, right? And went up to the top of the staircase and just dropped a pot of red ink on the paper. And it, explosion, typical yeah. Ralph Steadman yeah. energy, you know, yeah. wild. So it's a brilliant cover, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So the, the whole concept took off really well and everyone was really cooperative. I loved the idea, all the artists, you know. Didn't, you had, you had I, 51 I, people on that album. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to get... I. I Check with the master engineer, like, how many minutes can yeah. you get on an album? Yeah. And he said, about 50. Yeah. So that's great. Oh. Yeah. So I squeezed them on. And uh, that came out as an album. And I think it also came out as a micro cassette release, didn't it? Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. We did like, 100, didn't we? We did 100. A micro cassette is one of those little tiny cassette tapes that people used to use in dictation machines and answer that's phones. Right. And yeah. And I just thought it'd be nice to have it as a sort of art object, really. Absolutely. And I, I, I um. Did you keep one? Oh yeah, I've still got one. Because I haven't got one, so they must be really rare. I only did a hundred at the time. They were, they yeah. are very rare. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I don't know how we sold them. How did you sell them? I think it was mail order. It, May, it would have been, fast, wouldn't it? Yeah. And uh, yeah. in each one. Well, first of all, I made each tape myself, one at a time, recorded yeah. from the master onto the micro yeah. tape. And then I put it in a little box about that big, which had lots of little things in it, like a tiny playing card, a page from a tiny Bible, another page from a tiny edition of Shakespeare, and four slides, 35mm slides, with all the, the original album cover on, all the credits on them. We should mention that also the artists all had a certain space in a fold-out poster that came with the album too. That's right. Yeah, so they could do visually an expression too. Yeah, they the poster. a restricted space they had. That's right, it was yeah. a poster, it was two foot by two foot, so you yeah. fold it in a quarter and it fitted in the album, yeah. and each person had a little box like that to yeah. do whatever they want, a photo, yeah. a poem, whatever, so that would look nice. And so there was a slide copy of that in the micro-cassette box yeah. as well. Right, it was so real... smaller and smaller. Original, genuine collector's edition, again ahead of its time. Yeah, the that hundred kind of, of them. That done more these days, but that was another first, probably. Thank you. So, we move on. Um, and the next thing I really remember about your career was you had a party. You used to have these great parties in your tiny flat. You'd in... forgotten one album, though. Well, I hadn't, there, was the, there, was the, there was the slow music album with Log Hoxhill. Yeah. I haven't forgotten, but we need to move on, and otherwise we'll be here three oh, hours. No, too prolific, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but you did an album with, uh, we should just register that, you did an album called Slow Music with Log Hoxhill. Very, Very ambient album, album. yeah. yeah I, I basically yeah. recorded him and then made lots of tape loops. Yeah. And it was, it was quite Eno-influenced. 
yeah. album, but I really like it. I think it's still one of my favourites. Another great character, Long Cox Hill. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, he's still going. So I remember you having this party. It was a really good party. And then I think you disappeared from your own party about 1.30 in the morning. Mm. And I got this call around 9 o'clock the following morning said, I've moved into a hotel. I forget which hotel it the was. The Ritz Hotel? You'd, moved into, you'd call me from the Ritz Hotel, got me up. I said, what are you doing, Morgan? He said, I'm finished with my life. I want to change everything. It's not working anymore. I thought, well, all right then. Come and have dinner with me at the Ritz. So that evening, Sunday evening, I had to put the suit on because it was a, it was a suit and tie job. Right. So I get around <laughs> there and you tell me, well, no, you're finished with music, everything. You're going to move to India. So that was, that's a big step. What was going on with you at that time? Um, well, for a while, I mean, and I'd been interested in meditation and uh, spirituality, and I'd read books about it over the years, about Zen and different things and Buddhism. I was sort of kind of attracted, because I'd never been brought up in a religious home. My parents were communists and very political. And, but I always enjoyed churches, always enjoyed going into places like that, but I didn't really care about what they did there. I just liked being there. And then... I started to investigate, um, TM was the first thing, Transcendental Meditation, which is right. what the Maharishi was doing, which is of course where the Beatles and Donovan went in the 60s. And uh, I was at a point in my life where I just started to get interested in like, what makes me tick, because I think I'd already had quite an up and down life, and success and failure, success and failure. And it, it started to affect me less and less. I thought, well... My life is not so dependent on what's happening outside that I don't have to be a famous rock star in order to be happy. In fact, sometimes at those peaks, it was actually the busiest, most uh, stressful time of my life rather than the happiest time. Sometimes the happiest time was when I was actually doing nothing or just driving a van for an off-license for actually a very nice, peaceful time. So I, I don't know, inevitably started to think, well, what makes you tick? What, what are we here for? And, and, and started looking around, you know, and... And then I went to a guy, it was related to a health thing, because after 12 years or so of intense rock and roll, I'd actually overindulged a lot, mainly in drink and food, and it's a very regular lifestyle. And I was actually not ill, but just worn out. And I think you introduced me to a guy who was doing acupuncture at that time Trump's in England. England it? No, it was the yeah. other guy up in Hampstead, oh, South time. Africa. Oh, yeah, I know it was, yeah. I can't remember his name, but a really nice guy. Saddam, yeah. He did acupuncture, homeopathy... One more thing, what was it? Well, nu nutri nutrition. So yeah. he basically advised me to have a clean-out diet and eat salad for a month. And I was like, yeah, thank so you, you very much. raw food for a month. I had yeah. raw food and water yeah. for a month. Yeah. And it was yeah. the best thing I ever done. Yeah. And you can eat as much as you want, any salad you like, as yeah. long as it's raw. And uh, I, had the, I had a great time making salads. And I just moved into this flat in Notting Hill. So everything yeah. was new. And, yeah. and this flat was on the fifth floor with no lift. And after being in this diet for a while, I found myself running up the stairs in this yeah. flat. Felt incredible, lost a lot of weight. And he said, actually, would you like to try meditation? And it was great, because I had a, finally had someone to give me some guidance. But actually, by that time, I'd, fa I'd started investigating TM and the Maharishi. Because he was suggesting another kind of meditation, which we'll get back to later. So I got into TM and did that for about a year. And you got into it as well, didn't you? I was, I was, I was already doing TM. You were already yeah. into it. Yeah. So we, we went and did some weekends together yeah, in Brighton. Did. And things. They weren't very lively, were they? <laughs> no, in the end I found it a bit yeah. boring because there yeah. was too many rules. It was yeah. too restrictive, like no yeah. alcohol, no sex, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I thought, yeah. well, yeah, I can see the point of not meditating while you're drunk, but I don't <laughs> really see the point of if never get, having a drink or never exactly. having sex. I thought, well, wait, something's not quite right here. If you're going to get enlightened, you might, have, might as well have fun doing it. Well, that sounded too much like the Christian thing, yeah. the repressive approach. So I thought, yeah. well, that's not quite right. So then I started to look around again and found um, a guy called Rajneesh, who seemed to have a much more wide-ranging approach to, especially to introducing meditation to Western people not, who are not Indian, who are not Japanese, you know. Yeah. And seeing that perhaps we need a bit of a more easygoing and less repressive approach to it. And, and he had a centre in London, and I started going there. And I found the people there were really juicy and alive and, and, and creative and, and sensuous. Yeah. And I thought, no, I like these people. 
this is this is interesting for me. So I started getting more and more into that and started going to their meditations, which were also not just sitting quietly the whole time. Some of them involved dancing, uh, screaming, catharting, you know, yeah. something a bit like Primal well, Scream. A bit like being on stage, I would imagine, with a band. So a bit like being in a punk band, yeah. yeah. It yeah. was, actually. Yeah. And you could, you could express things. A bit like Primal... Well, I never did Primal Scream, but Lennon mm. was very much influenced by it. Yeah. I mean, the passion on Lennon's Plastic Owner Band album, most of it came from the Primal Scream experience he'd had. So sort of freed him, in a way, and I yeah. thought, well, I want some of that. And this helped me in many ways. And uh, it was interesting because I was at the point of actually really becoming musically liberated anyway. I mean, I'd done the Hybrid Kids album, you know, two punky experimental album. I'd done the Miniatures album, which is an incredible mixture. And I'd done an ambient album. So I'd done a lot of stuff in like two years. And that somehow I just thought, uh, well, I've done that. <laughs> I don't really yeah, need to repeat to it. On it was like yeah. I'd done it once yeah. and that was enough. It was yeah. interesting. So I thought, I don't know what else to do except to continue more intensely with this path I'm on and just go to India where the Rajneesh lived and had a very big ashram and just go into it fully. Didn't seem to be anything else I wanted to do at that point. And I thought it might be forever, but I wasn't sure. I just didn't want to have a plan of I'll just go for a month or something and see what it's like. I wanted to give myself an open door, you know, just dive through and see where I come out. I actually, after that chaotic night where I actually walked away from my own party, because it was getting really mad, it was like, it was very classic how it happened, because I'd had quite a few wild parties at home, and this was one of the most wild ones. It was packed. There was a lot of young punks there. And I remember... It was me and the guitarist and the damned, I think, were really getting on well at the party. And my speakers started to sort of collapse. I mean, the sound, they started to break up. It was really loud. And the sound was getting really distorted and mad and cutting out. It was very symbolic in a way. <laughs> like, what was going on in me was the same. Right. And so, me and the guitarist and the damned were listening to it on the headphones. Louder and louder and louder and louder, and started screaming in each other's faces and really having an incredible time. And then at some point, I just took the headphones off and thought, Well, that's enough. I'm, I'm just leaving. I need to be alone. And I called the Ritz and booked a room and managed to find a suit and got a taxi there. And but it was nice to do it in style like that. Absolutely. Like I felt this was a momentous event. Yeah. And, it, and it wasn't painful or anything. It was just like, Well, now it's time to do this. So let's get it. It's just clear it was time for a change. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting breakthrough, in a yeah. way. And so that day, I mean, when we met, I thought, well, maybe this is it, and I'm leaving on the next plane. But then, as I cooled down and calmed down, I thought, well, I'm going to do it, but I think I need to take care of practical things. So I gave myself three months to tie loose ends up. And, yeah. You know, I think I, s I sold my flat, or... Anyway, I told the landlord I wouldn't I be around for a while. Actually, yeah. Yeah. In the end, I sold yeah. it when I came back came, from yeah. India. So I tidied things up. I thought, but let's, let's be adult about this. And uh, three months later, when I got to India, um, to the Rajneesh Ashram, and the day before I got there, he went into silence. Because he, he was talking every day, wasn't he? He was talking every day, very interesting yeah. lectures, covering yeah. all kinds of religion and yeah. philosophy, yeah. Very, very erudite and, and fascinating. Yeah. And he, he stopped doing it the day I got there. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, no, why didn't I come three months ago when yeah. I felt like it? Yeah. But actually it turned out to be the best thing that could happen to me because I didn't need a lot of words at, at that time. I needed to just be quiet. Yeah. And to be quiet in a room with 5,000 other people was actually an amazing experience. And it was like he was just the focal point for that. It wasn't like, it wasn't like we're um, worshipping him. It's basically he's the excuse for us to sit there with ourselves for an hour or two in total silence. It was one of the most healing things, I suppose, I've done mm. in my life, you know. And I stayed there, well, I mean, I started going through things there, because they, they had a lot of therapy courses and things, as well as meditation yes, sessions. so you could work on yourself. As such. Yeah, I mean, things yeah. like uh, looking at your childhood and things that have, you think have messed you up, and trying to find out what they were. And yeah. Mainly so you can become more and more clear and meditate more and more deeply, and I think it was a very good combination of things that was going on there. 
And you ended up changing your name. We went, went from Morgan to Viet Dam. Viet Dam, yeah, because yeah. he had that idea of changing names and becoming a disciple. Some people thought yeah. it was really weird, and I said, "Well, wait a minute." Carlos Santana became David Ip. Pete Townsend had a name, I think. I think he did, yeah. Um, John McLaughlin became Mahavishnu. Yeah. So I thought, well, they're pretty cool musicians. I yeah. think it's all right. Yeah. I'll do that. So I did. And Vidam actually is a Sanskrit name which means beyond religion. And I was quite surprised because I thought, well, I'm not religious. But I think what he was saying was this is, at some point, you have to go beyond any path or any discipline to find your freedom. Yeah. I thought, well, that's a nice name. I, uh, I'll go with that. So you became Viet Dam, and you um, you stayed there till he left, and he went to America. Right. And then I remember you coming back, and I went to the airport and picked you up, and you had nowhere to stay, but it just so happened that things were falling into place for you because that weekend I was going away. You stayed in my flat that weekend, and I think you rented your flat out on the Monday. The person was vacating, so. It was a flow in your life, and you came back to London. There was a bit of a readjustment. Right. And then you got really involved with the, with the, with the Rajneesh community for a time, didn't you? I think you lived in the community in America for a time. Well, I went to Belgium first, went actually. Went to Belgium, because, okay. Because, yeah. yeah, Rajneesh decided to move suddenly to America, and uh, it placed things in a bit of a turmoil, because some people were in India and thought they were there forever. They thought yeah. they'd found Nibbana. Well, he... he he had different ideas. I don't he? know if he decided that, but he thought, you can't get settled like that. It's, it's going to stunt your growth. So we need yeah. to change things here. So he yeah. stirred up everything. And uh, they started to make a new common in America, but it needed a bit of time to set up. So I was looking around, because I felt like staying within a, the commune so we could meditate every day and just keep it going on a regular basis, rather than having a day job and just doing it as a part-time thing. So I, I, I looked around and they, they had communes in most major cities in Europe and I found one in Brussels and decided to go there and um, stayed there about a year. And then during that year, we were asked to, because we were all living in the commune together, it was a bit like, you know, hippie commune if you like, sort of self-sufficient but not really generating any income or anything, yeah. we just had the place, people would come and meditate, I ran the kitchen for a while, yeah. became a vegetarian chef and all that and it was really nice and people came and went, Some, not just people in the commune but members of the public would come in and try meditation out, it was very pleasant. But, um, they were setting up this huge commune in America and they needed some money for that and they needed us to become more independent. So I just thought, well, maybe it's time to get back in the music business in some way. And I just sent out a lot of letters, actually, because this was in the days before email and fax, you know, and uh, sent about 20 letters to people I knew in England. Yeah. And I got back a telegram from Brian May. From Queen. Yeah, yeah. and he said, do you want to play with us? So, yeah. so I suddenly went from being penniless in a hippie commune to on stage with Queen. So it was another whoosh. Yeah. Here we go again. <laughs> so yeah. oh, you were really in the flow with life. Interesting. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so I ended up doing a European tour with Queen, and uh, must have been amazing playing in front of what ten thousand people. Oh yeah, ten twenty thousand yeah. most nights. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. I mean, they're an amazing band, of course, but it was different to say Mott the Hill Paul because it wasn't as spontaneous. It was very professional, very yes. perfectly worked yeah. out. Yeah, and. Very good, but not, not, not as much fun as Mott the Hoople, actually, for okay. me. And also I made the mistake of... Because um, the Rajneesh commune, they, they had this thing about dressing in red, which was his idea to make us, like, more conscious of what we're doing. So, and, and people would ask us, well, why are you doing this? So it sort of put us on the spot, in a way. Yes. And that was what he wanted us to yeah. do. And not just go off in some dream, but to be able to be... Um, articulate about what we're doing and if someone asked why you're wearing red you'd have something to say and I kept that up while I was with Queen and eventually they realized that I was not the drunken Morgan Fisher they used to know in Mott the Hoople <laughs> you know because Queen yeah. did um, the only time Queen ever opened for anybody was when they did a US and UK tour with Mott the Hoople so they were our opening band this is where that circle closes up yes. again because yeah. uh, you know I'd met Brian May when I had the Morgan band which is probably why they asked me 
Morgan band, Motley Hoover, they'd known me in these two bands. They, it was the first time they'd had an extra man on stage with them and they probably wanted someone that they knew for a long time who was reliable. But actually, yeah. I'd changed. So <laughs> I wasn't the Morgan Fisher from Motley Hoover who used to get drunk most nights and enjoy wrecking hotel rooms and all that. Yeah. And I was quite quiet and a bit enigmatic and they didn't know what to make of me. So... They asked me to leave, basically, they said, yes. well, you know, yeah. politely, but they said, what they said was, we don't need a keyboard player anymore, which wasn't quite true, because they got someone else in later, yeah. but it was their only, I think they were embarrassed about the whole okay. situation, and uh, I should have handled it better, I think, but then, on the other hand, one door closes, another opens, and I wasn't really cut out to be a member of Queen yeah, anyway, of course, yeah. so that's all right, so, yeah. I did, so I did the European tour, and that was that. And then went to America after that to join the, the new commune yes, there and yeah. get back to meditation. And not only meditation, I mean, it was a very big place in the Oregon Mountains, 120 square miles. And we did, I mean, I did things I'd never done before or since, for that matter, which is farming, building, working yeah. in a massive kitchen, all sorts of things which were actually great experiences. It was very yeah. grounding, you know, I mean, simple manual labor where you don't use your head all the time, because I'm a bit intellectual that way. And it's, it made things very simple, and, uh, and it was very healthy too. So I did that for a couple of years. And then you moved to Japan. Yeah, I was... Um, I didn't live in this Oregon commune the whole time. I, I was living in various other cities in America from time to time, earning a bit of money and so on. And the last city I lived in was Hollywood, or Hollyweird, if you like, because it, it was pretty bizarre. I mean, if, unless you're in the film business, working in Hollywood, it's a strange place to live. And uh, it didn't feel right. So at that time, I had an English girlfriend and um, we were um, looking at a map. We said, well, let's, let's try somewhere else. So we got this map of America and looked at it. And I've been to nearly every major city in America with Mott the Hoople. And I looked around and thought, nothing really grabs me. Uh, what else we got? And turned the page and there was Japan. And we looked at each other and said, yeah. Let's go there. And within a week we were there. No job, couldn't speak a word, of, no contacts. Yeah. $500 in our pocket. Just made a go of it then. Fantastic. And yeah. I'm still there. She left after six months. <laughs> <laughs> she broke down crying and said, I don't like it in Japan. And I said, oh, all right, I'll see you then. <laughs> so she went back to England and I'm still yeah. there 23 years later. And your music changed quite a lot because then you were... Uh, you were making much more, I think ambient's the wrong, the wrong word, but softer music, more melodic music, more heartful music maybe. How would you describe the music you started making in Japan? Yeah, I'd actually had a bit of experience making music like that in the, in the commune because sometimes it wasn't all sitting in silence. Sometimes I wanted some, some sort of flowing music in the background. And it wasn't, it, sometimes it got a bit sweet and new agey, but the idea was that you would play with no plan whatsoever, and you just see what comes out, and you just lay your hands on the keyboard, see where it leads. Right. And that was the kind of first for me. I'd never really had that experience. And, and you have to, because there's several thousand people sitting in meditation, you can't muck about. You know, the stuff's got to be good, and it's got yeah. to be very focused and very clear. And that was a very interesting experience. And I did that many times at the uh, commune. And so when I got to Japan, I was amazed to find that there were people there who not only knew Mott the Hoople, of course, but they knew hybrid kids and miniatures, which had actually been imported there or released there, and I didn't know that. They were both and, released there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know that, you see, yeah. and uh, people came up to me and said, oh, those great albums, you know, and yeah. would you like to do something? And I thought, well, because I wasn't playing at that time professionally, I was teaching English just to make ends meet. And... Um, I started doing gigs in small clubs and I had no equipment. I'd just go and play the piano and, and do similar things that I'd been doing in the commune where I'd just improvise. And I really liked it and eventually acquired a few keyboards and started getting back into music in a totally different way, mo mostly on my own. And someone invited me to do a movie score, so I did a score for a movie about cockroaches, animated movie. It's quite a good movie, actually. Twilight of the Cockroaches. You can find it on eBay, <laughs> if you look. <laughs> the, that I, I that was the first, a film yeah. score. You know. And then you had Water Music, which was yeah. an album that I really liked and we released on mm. Druid in the UK. Right. How did that come about, Water Music? Um, 
just someone I met said I've got an Indies label, I'll give you X amount of money, three days in the studio, do what you like. Just okay. three days. So I just basically improvised. But it was going back a um, little bit to the principle used on the Slow Music album with Lowell Coxall, wasn't it? Although it was different end result, yeah. it seemed the principle was a little bit similar. Well, a lot of it was like using tape loops and long delays, which yeah. Brian Eno had done on Music for Airports. And yeah. <clears throat> that sort of approach, yeah. yeah. So we'd set up a long tape delay and I'd just play yeah. something spontaneously. It could be yeah. on a piano or synthesizer or electric piano. And it all came together quite quickly. And then I, I thought I'd make the cover myself, so I made a cover using Japanese handmade paper and stuff just the design and I thought water music seemed like a good theme so there was tracks on it like after the rain and the great lakes and ice melting and it's just water related titles yeah it was a very pleasant experience so you liked it and you put it out here right yeah along with peace in the heart of the city that was another album I made yeah after the film score the company released it said would you like to do an album and I said okay and I um they offered me an advance and I said, listen, instead of me using a normal studio, would, could you build a small studio for me? And they said, okay, because I preferred that situation because I've been doing that in London and I really yeah. like just doing everything myself. And the budget was enough for them to rent a flat and, and soundproof it and make a small studio for me. So I did that and, uh, yeah, I just felt like continuing with the um, keyboard improvisations. Oh, they became compositions. Yeah. Um, and Peace in the Heart of the City seemed a good title because it was something I realised I'd always liked. That I grew up in North London in Finchley, which is quite relaxed part of town, and, and there were parks around. In fact, there's a dairy farm opposite my house, and it's still there. It's, imagine a cow farm in London, but it, <laughs> there it was. And I grew up with that. And, yeah. and I realised that I liked that better than being in the country. I yeah. like a peaceful part of the city because there's people around and the people are peaceful when you go to the country often there's not there's no people around there's you and nature which is very nice but there's a sort of lonely quality to being in the country so it's country's all right to visit but to live i like being in a peaceful part of a big city so you've got your home base and then you can go into town and get all the culture or whatever it is you want and that's what i've been doing in tokyo ever since and i live in a in the equivalent of, say, Chiswick in West London. I live in a small flat next to a river and a park, which is like 20 minutes by tube from central Tokyo. So the idea of peace in the heart of the city was something I realised that that's what I need, that's what nourishes me. And I thought, I'm sure there are people who would appreciate that because Tokyo is such a busy metropolis yeah. and people overwork there terribly. And the record company really liked the idea and they gave it the same basic title in Japanese and just because of the title it sold quite well. Yeah, no, I understand. We're running out of time now, Morgan, okay. so mm. I know you've made quite a few other albums in Japan, you're still based there <coughs> and also mm. you've been doing painting and photography, mm -hmm. which we can maybe look at in a separate little snippet program. Mm. But I think the interesting thing with your life has <coughs> been this kind of journey which is your, your music and your art side, if you like, has expressed your inner journey and you started off obviously with Love Affair to Mot the Hoop all very loud and rocky and British lines and then something changed in you personally and you started to go kind of deeper inside and relax more and then the music went deeper and relaxed more. It's very interesting over the years. Mm -hmm. Seems so. a very natural process to me and uh and it's not always quiet and peaceful. I mean, now I'm doing, for four years, I've been doing a monthly improvisation gig in a really nice club in Tokyo. And I just bring down my vintage keyboards and just play. And sometimes it gets really loud, too. Yeah. So it's like waves, okay. you know, but it's more natural yeah. somehow. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you for coming on and talking to us on Cherry Red TV. Thanks and, for having me. Uh, thank you for watching Cherry Red TV and hearing Morgan Fisher's story. And we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everyone.